Welcome everyone to Letchworth State Park. I'm Conrad, I'm an environmental educator here at Letchworth, and I've invited you here today to explore the world of mammals. When we say mammal, what do we really mean? A scientist would say that a mammal is an animal with warm blood and hair that feeds its babies milk. If you put your hand on your forehead, it should feel warm to you. If you look at your arm, you might see some teeny tiny hairs. And if you think way back to when you were a baby, or if you have younger siblings, you might remember that babies, when they're very, very young, do drink milk. Human beings are mammals. In the wild, mammals are a diverse group of organisms. They're a big group of living things with lots of different members. Many different kinds of animals are considered mammals. Something they all have in common is that they all have nature jobs. Just by living life, mammals help other kinds of living things to survive and thrive in their natural ecosystem. Some mammals have nature jobs that help humans to survive and thrive. When we're looking for signs of mammals that they might be doing their nature jobs, we could look for some signs of food that's been left behind, or maybe some ways that mammals have shaped their natural environment, or maybe even some animal homes that mammals have built. We'll start our journey here at the Humphrey Nature Center. The Humphrey Nature Center has lots of different environments around it, some meadow areas and some younger woods and some older, more mature woods for us to explore. So follow me and we'll head off into the young woods here outside Humphrey Nature Center. This open area is a great place to start looking for mammals. In fact, there's a mammal sign just above my head right now. That lump of leaves with no sticks way up high in the branches of a tree must be a squirrel nest. Some people might call it a gray squirrel's dray. Gray squirrels love to live in this part of the forest because there are many different kinds of young trees that provide many different kinds of foods. What kinds of foods do gray squirrels eat? Looking closely at their skulls, we can see that the teeth, especially in the back, look all the same. If we look really closely at those teeth, we notice that they're all wide and flat in the back. Wide, flat teeth, which a scientist would call molars, are really good for grinding up tough plant material, turning it into an edible paste. If we look up in the front of the mouth, the squirrels have these long, skinny teeth at the very, very front. The teeth at the very front of a mammal's mouth are called the incisors. And a squirrel's incisors are especially long and strong for slicing through and chopping through the skins of nuts. Squirrels love to eat nuts and seeds, and those really long teeth in the front are great for chopping through the tough outer shell of the nuts. And those wide, flat teeth in the back are great for grinding the nut material into an edible paste. Those teeth which are really, really specialized for eating nuts, are a secret to the gray squirrel's success. They're an adaptation that helps them survive. Gray squirrels can't find nuts and seeds all year long growing on the trees, so they rely on their drays and some hollow trees to keep them away from the worst winter weather. Sometimes they might even hide in somebody's attic or inside somebody's shed. Gray squirrels don't really have the thick fur that a lot of other mammals will have. Their fur is really, really short, and they don't have a lot of woolly hair really, really close to their skin. They're not very good at trapping air close to their skin, which would keep them warm. Air is a very good insulator, which means it's hard to warm up and hard to cool down. Gray squirrels, while they are gathering nuts and seeds throughout the year to save for the winter time, are doing a really important nature job. Gray squirrels, by putting those nuts and seeds in hard to get to places, are kind of like nature's 
foresters. They're planting and reestablishing very young trees in hard to get to places so that they'll grow up to be the next generation of forest trees. Gray squirrels in open areas like this are great animals to have around because these open areas will eventually become mature forest. There's a spot just down the trail from here where the trees are a little bit older. In fact, they're so old that some of them are starting to fall over. Fallen trees are a great place to look for our next mammal signs. With so many fallen trees, this part of the forest is a great place for mammals to raise their babies. When a tree falls over, it pulls up a lot of the dirt that's next to its roots. And that makes that spot a little bit softer and a little bit easier for mammals to dig into. Lots of different mammals like to raise their babies underground in a temporary animal home. That animal home is called a den, and one of the mammals that's most successful at making dens in this part of the forest are red foxes. Red foxes are pretty common in Letra State Park. Our visitors see them all the time, and they do a really important nature job. Looking closely at their skulls, we notice these long, skinny teeth pointing down past all the other teeth in the mouth. If we look really closely at those teeth, we notice that not only are they longer than the others, but they curve backwards, kind of like a fish hook. Curving backwards like a fish hook, they're really, really good at catching and holding on to other animals that red foxes like to eat as their food. Those kinds of teeth a scientist would call canine teeth, and an animal that eats other animals as its food a scientist would call a carnivore, a meat eater. Being carnivores, red foxes can be active throughout the entire year. Their food never goes out of season, but they need an adaptation, a secret to success to survive that winter weather. That adaptation is their wonderful thick red fur. The fur layer is really, really close to the skin. It's this thick, woolly, curly hair that's kind of grayish next to the skin. Those curly hairs catch lots of air and hold it in between the gaps in between the hairs. That helps to insulate the red fox like a big puffy jacket. As they're running around in the winter and catching those mice and rats, red foxes are doing a really important nature job. Mice and rats get into trouble a lot with humans. They get into our homes sometimes, and they eat human food, and they sometimes even spread diseases, and make us sick. Red foxes, in taking out some of those mice and rats, make them less likely to come into human homes and cause those problems. Red foxes are like nature's pest control. They control those smaller animals that can cause lots of problems for humans. Lots of different carnivores do that nature job, but red foxes are really, really good at it because they're comfortable living close to humans. You might have even seen red foxes in your neighborhood, maybe underneath someone's deck or maybe even building a den under someone's shed. But not every mammal is just an herbivore or just a carnivore. Lots of different mammals eat lots of different foods. There's a young forest just down the trail from here where I think we might be able to see some signs of those kinds of mammals. Here in the young forest, we're starting to see some bigger trees and some more opportunities for mammals to be successful. In fact, we found our next mammal sign here at the base of this tree. Our mammal sign here is this long, skinny object. Looking more closely at it, we can tell that it's about the same size as one of my fingers and blunt on the ends. Looking inside without getting too close to it, it looks like there are some obvious seeds inside. This is some animal poop, a scientist would say, animal scat. And judging by its length, its blunt ends, and the obvious seeds inside, we can tell that this is raccoon scat. Raccoons are a type of animal that eat both plants and meat. They can catch some of their own prey, but they also eat lots of plants, especially fruits in nature. That makes them an omnivore. As omnivores eating both plants and meat, raccoons have plenty of adaptation secrets to success that help them to be successful. 
looking more closely at their skulls, we notice that not all of their teeth are exactly the same. They have lots of different kinds of teeth for lots of different kinds of foods. Looking more closely at those teeth, we immediately recognize those big, wide, flat molars in the back, but we also immediately recognize those long, skinny, grabby teeth, those canines that the fox had. Raccoons are able to smash up plants like a squirrel and catch their own prey like a fox. Being omnivores, they're active throughout the year, but they tend to hide from the most intense winter weather. They have an adaptation, a secret to success, to protect them from the worst winter weather. This thick fur coat. Like the fox, they grow in an extra thick layer of fur next to their skin. And underneath that fur layer is a layer of fat. Fat builds up under the skin as raccoons eat really, really fatty, high energy foods. And the fat digests very, very slowly. It's like having a bunch of extra food stored up in its body already. That helps the raccoons when they're holed up, denned up, hiding from the most intense winter weather, blasting winds and really, really cold air. You hardly ever see raccoons out and about during that really intense winter weather. That's because raccoons like to hide in hollow logs or maybe even your attic or your shed during that worst intense winter weather. Especially in the summer, raccoons are eating their favorite rich sugary fruits. They eat blueberries and blackberries and cherries, a lot of the same fruits that we like to eat. As they're eating all of those kinds of fruits, they're also eating a lot of the seeds. We saw in the scat that there were some of those seeds. When raccoons leave scat with seeds inside them, it's like giving the seeds free fertilizer. Wherever the raccoons go, they're planting those berry and cherry seeds around the forest, spreading them out to places where maybe those seeds couldn't get to normally to germinate and grow into new fruit trees and berry bushes that humans like to eat. This way, raccoons are kind of like nature's gardeners. They're planting trees and shrubs in difficult to get to areas, which humans sometimes enjoy. Sometimes mammals can eat so many wild plants that they wind up negatively affecting their natural ecosystem. There's a spot just down the trail from here that's a great example of that. If you follow me, I'll show you exactly what that looks like. This part of the forest is completely at the mercy of mammals. A mammal has come through and picked clean all of the soft, tender plants down here on the forest floor. The only plants that are really able to do very well are grass, which are not normal to see in a forest, and these bushes right here. You can see a lot more growing behind me there. This kind of a bush has some small thorns that are quite sharp. It's called Japanese barberry. And the success of Japanese barberry in this part of the forest means that whatever mammal is picking all the forest floor clean doesn't have specialized teeth to deal with thorns. This must be the handiwork of white-tailed deer. Looking closely at a white-tailed deer's skull, we notice that their teeth are unlike some of the other animals that we've seen so far. They really don't have any teeth between the front part of their mouths and the back part of their mouths. All the teeth in the back are those wide, flat molars for grinding up plants, and they don't have any incisors at all on the top parts of their mouth. On the roofs of their mouth, they don't have any incisors at all. The deer have flat, tough pads there to help them to twist and snip off plants rather than clip them off with the ends of their incisors like a squirrel could. The incisors on their bottom jaw are really only good for pinching and twisting off plants. White-tailed deer are active throughout the entire year, which means they're feeding on young plants even through the most intense winter weather. They have some adaptations, some secrets to success that help them do that. One of the most important are their thick hides, which are covered in these highly specialized hairs. They don't have any fur layer really close to their skin, like the red fox does. The air that's trapped by white-tailed deer hairs can't be trapped in a fur layer. They're actually trapped inside the hair itself. 
If we bend a white-tailed deer hair, we can tell that it doesn't bend like a string, like our hair or other mammals' hair would. It kinks like a straw, which means that that hair is hollow. The air that's trapped in white-tailed deer hair is trapped inside of the middle of the hair itself. Normally, as white-tailed deer are feeding, they're kind of like nature's trimmers. They clear out old areas of growth, leaving space for new plants to move in and different kinds of animals to thrive. But if there are too many white-tailed deer in a particular area, that means they're doing their nature jobs too effectively. They leave the woods looking kind of like this, with fewer species of plants on the forest floor and fewer animals that will prefer to live here. There are some areas of Lecturer State Park, though, where white-tailed deer don't move quite so much. There's one spot just down the trail from here. It's a more mature stand of trees. If we look there, I think we can find some signs of other kinds of mammals that prefer to live in the deep woods. Here in the deeper woods, the trees have had many, many years to grow really tall, spread out really wide, and cover the forest floor in shade. This is a pretty hard place for a lot of plants to make a living. Not a lot of sunlight makes it through those tall tree branches all the way down to the forest floor. The forest floor is pretty open, pretty unobstructed, and also pretty dark. It's hard to see even in broad daylight here, and especially hard to see at night. This is an ideal place for some of the best adapted predators to thrive. Some predators, as they're traveling around the forest floor, leave very few signs that they've even been around, maybe the occasional lucky footprint or the occasional scat, but they spend so much time far away from park roads and park trails, we and the park visitors are unlikely to see them. Some of the best signs that we have that these predators might be around are crossing logs, like this one behind me. Crossing logs are an opportunity for a wide-ranging predator to pass through some kind of barrier, maybe a steep gully or a, a stream or like a, a muddy pond like this one. Sometimes we'll put up hidden cameras at these crossing logs to see what kinds of predators might be around, and if we get lucky, we might get a picture or a video of one. We're always really, really excited when we're lucky enough to get pictures or videos of bobcats. Bobcats are some of the best adapted predators around. They have many adaptations, many secrets to success that help them to do that. Looking closely at their skulls, bobcats have a pretty rounded skull. It's more rounded than the other skulls that we've seen today. They have these great big eye sockets. They're really, really round and large, and that tells us that bobcats have really well-developed eyes, which help them to hunt in the low light of the forest, especially at night when they do a lot of their traveling around and hunting. Looking underneath the skull, bobcats have these great big round bulbs at the base of their skulls. Those bulbs are a bony shield protecting the bobcat's hearing organs. A scientist would call that round bulb the auditory bulla. Inside the auditory bulla is a long curled up organ, looks kind of like a snail shell. The scientist would call that the cochlea. The bobcat cochleas being so long and curled up give bobcats access to a wide range of sounds. Bobcats can hear all kinds of little noises and rustlings in the forest, from really, really high pitches to really, really low pitches. Some of the lowest pitches in the forest are the rustlings and movements of animals as they're trying to hide and go about their business secretly in the woods. Bobcats are really good at hunting by ear. Bobcats, in hunting such large prey, unusually large prey, need a few more adaptations to help them do that. They're active throughout the winter hunting this large prey because these large animals are constantly feeding and constantly fueling their bodies and also constantly affecting their natural surroundings. Looking closely at bobcat fur, we notice that it's not nearly as long as a lot of the other furs that we've seen today, but it is very dense. These hairs in bobcat fur are growing out of the skin in incredible density. That dense fur helps to protect bobcats from blasting arctic storms that sometimes rip through in the winter and helps to insulate them really well as they're traveling through the woods. They have these 
fantastically adapted claws, which can retract, pull into the foot when the bobcat isn't using them to catch prey or to climb a tree or to run through the forest with a burst of speed. Up higher on their wrist, they have this super specialized claw, it corresponds with our thumb. We call that a dew claw. If you've had a dog or a cat before, you might be familiar with that term, dew claw. It's kind of like a thumb. It helps the bobcats to grapple with and wrestle with really large prey, like wild turkeys and even white-tailed deer. As they're hunting large prey, like white-tailed deer, they're not only helping to reduce the populations of deer, but they help to move the deer around a little bit. The deer, if they know a bobcat is in the area, are less likely to just stay in one spot and completely mow down all of the plants in one particular part of the forest. Bobcats are kind of like nature's wildlife managers. They help to reduce some populations of large mammals and help to move them around a little bit, which not only helps the forest floor to generate more plants, but also helps the deer because with less population density and less hanging around in the same areas, the deer are less likely to spread diseases to each other. Anytime that we're lucky enough to get a picture or a video of a bobcat, we're reminded of that really important nature job that they do that so few other mammals are able to do. Now from here, our trail goes right back to the Humphrey Nature Center. If you join me there, it seems like a great place to bring our mammals field trip full circle. There are so many more mammals out there than just what we saw signs of today. And whether they're an herbivore, a carnivore, an omnivore, or a forester, a pest control, a gardener, trimmer, or wildlife management, they all have nature jobs that benefits the forest and benefits us. Thank you so much for joining me. Please feel free to reach out with any questions you have about the mammals of New York State. And don't forget to practice your new mammalogy skills in your neighborhood, looking for signs of mammals that are benefiting where you live and benefiting you.